It's time to check your money with America's money maven, Vicki Brackens. Vicki Brackens is the president of Brackens Financial Solutions Network, LLC, and a registered representative of LPL Financial, member SIPC. Vicki, we got a special guest in the building. We have a very special guest in the building today, George. This is Miss Brianka Hill, who is the Director of Business Development for the City of Syracuse. She hails from Syracuse. Believe this or not, she was born and raised here. I'm sure she'll have a lot to say about that, but she uh, actually has her Bachelor of Arts degree from the State University of New York at Oswego, SUNY Oswego, in accountancy. But she is an integral part and I, this is one of the reasons I wanted to make sure she, we had her on. She is an integral part of what's happening in the business development atmosphere and ecosystem here in Syracuse, particularly for minority developers and individual businesses who are looking at their certification process as far as procurement and um, involvement with all of the city, state, and federal projects here uh, that are going up all over the place. So, Brianka, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, and yes, as you mentioned, even though I do have a background formally in accounting, I did transition here to economic development, and I love the world that I'm in now and the community that I'm servicing. Well, so I tell you, this, this morning, we really want to make sure that we give you the opportunity to talk about your passion, because we had a little bit of a conversation concerning what your your passion is concerning the type of work that you do. So why don't you share that with us now? Yeah, absolutely. So even though my primary role is to support the business landscape here in Syracuse, whether that's through um, business expansion, business startup, business retention needs, as well as even supporting our real estate developer base, I primarily have a focus in particular passion of creating more equity throughout the city. With that, I have um, very much so been very active and involved in helping our brown and black develop developer base as well as our minority and women owned businesses that exist throughout the city. So George, I saw you getting ready to ask a question and I know I forgot to do something. So go ahead. Okay. And ask the question. <laughs> I was like, Vicky just closed that door. I me. did. I closed it right <laughs> off. <laughs> Cause there was no way in. So thank you for inviting me to find out a little bit more about uh, Brianka and her background. Brianka as a Syracuse born and raised, where'd you go to school? So um, starting with elementary school, I'll say, I went to an elementary school that no longer exists, but I will say it's the best one that ever existed. It was called Solace. Solace, yes. I have some yes. Solace uh, folks in my family, so we okay. understand. Definitely understand why you say that. Yes, a beautiful school. Um, and then for middle school, I went to Levy as well as Huntington. And then I landed with Nottingham. I'm a former bulldog, or I'll say a bulldog for life, actually. I, I, I'm thinking you was going to hit that east side. That's what I was hearing. <laughs> <laughs> bulldog for life. All right. Now we got that out the way. Vicky could get back to business. <laughs> okay. Thank you, George. Okay. So you were talking about the fact that your passion is really about developing equity, equity within um, the framework of minority developers and women in business, women business owners, um, black and brown business owners in the local community. I'm going to kind of put these into two different silos. So let's talk a little bit first about the Syracuse development market as far as real estate development is concerned and what's happening with black and brown developers within, the, within this area. Everywhere we look, we're hearing about new buildings being built, uh, different projects coming online, uh, what's happening with you know the chimes building and all sorts of things as far as uh, multi-level how multi-level uh, housing? Give us an overview first of all of what the landscape looks like as far as the development market in general. Yeah, so I would say right now Syracuse is in what's called a renaissance phase. Um, there's massive opportunity for growth due to a lot of the different changes that are happening in the environment. 
hence, you know, Micron being one of the major players here. Um, so with that, we're in high demand and need of more housing, as well as even more development to be able to support not only the local base, but all of the projected population that will soon be migrating to our city. Um, I'll say this has created an immense amount of different opportunity for our city, including the different people that exist within it to be able to continue to build and create more spaces um, for our, um, I'll say, community to benefit from. So looking at all of that opportunity, what do you see specifically concerning minority developers or what has been done to encourage um, minority developers to get involved? So due to the fact that there's so much transformation happening, I think it only incentivizes more for minority, our minority group to get involved in essentially all of the money that's out there right now. Um, you know, we have different um, funding that's being allocated from either our state or our federal agencies to be able to support some of the projects, such as, for example, I-81 um, and the transformation that's happening, not only through the middle of the city, but also our East Adams historic 15th Ward area, um, you know, and then with that, we have, you know, different resources, I think, that are currently coming up, some that existed, but also other ones that our department has been strategically looking into to ensure that what's happening isn't missed by this minority group. Um, so, for example, um, some existing ones that the city currently offers and has offered for a while I would say is like SEDPO, which is the Syracuse Economic Development Corporation. It is the city's revolving loan fund. Even though it's a separate entity from the city, it's run by its own board members. Um, it does uh, allow for different people within the community, specifically targeted towards business owners, um, to take advantage of low interest, favorable financing. Um, and right now we have a program where people can tap into um, that can get anywhere from 25,000 up to $200,000 um, in financial assistance. Um, another big player here, Bianca, especially- if, for, for, yes. for, for Setco, for example, does, so these are developers, they don't necessarily have to live here, but the project has to be in the city. Am I understanding that right? It does need to exist within the city of Syracuse. Um, as I mentioned before, there are board members making these decisions and you, the actual developer living or business owner living in the city makes your chances and odds more favorable to secure okay. financing. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so yes, you're correct. You get another point on the application if you live here <laughs> and of course, the development has to be within the city limits. Within Got the it. city, okay. Yeah. Correct. We, also, we always support local. So um, another big one, I think, for larger scale development developments, anywhere from, I would say, um, 1 million and up is what's called CIDA, the Syracuse Industrial Development Agency. Um, so CIDA, CIDA offers like tax incentives for larger scale um, developments anything from like exemptions from property tax, um, sales tax, and even like mortgage recording taxes. Um, so that can be a huge resource when you're looking at making numbers work for projects and not having to either pay full taxes or any taxes at all for a certain period of time. Do they negotiate pilots, payment in lieu of tax agreements and things of that nature? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's a, a huge one that um, projects go after the pilot programs in addition to um, the other types of exemptions that I mentioned as well. You know, I think we, we met each other during the time period of a special conference that you had for minority developers. Um, I know that, is, is that still online for people to watch? 
Yes, we were able to um, essentially consolidate all the information from some of the previous BIPOC real estate developer summit conversations that we had um, and post those materials to the city's website. Um, our city's website is syr.gov. Um, essentially, if you search resources for minority developers, all of that information will pop up on a page. Um, I highly suggest we also recorded this full um, virtual summit. So I highly suggest that anyone interested in learning more about some of the resources I just mentioned, in addition to other ones, either funded through um, state partners such as HCR or even um, some other uh, partner financial institutions like the Community Preservation Corporation, please watch that presentation and please feel free after you do to reach out to our office if you're interested in learning more. Well, I, I know, and, and you said HCR, that's Home um, Historic, what, what does that stand for? Homes Community and Renewal. Homes Com Community and Renewal. We got lots of acronyms all over the yes. place. Okay, <laughs> that, that we have yeah. to make sure that everybody <laughs> under, understands. But, you know, last week, I think it was, the governor was here. The governor was here and made a, a huge announcement uh, concerning um, um, uh, what I would call a, a monumental pro project that's happening there near the zoo. Why don't you tell us more about that and then how individuals could possibly benefit from that? Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so essentially the site that was referenced during the governor's visit is called uh, the Syracuse Developmental Center, um, shortly known as the SDC. Um, this is a, I believe, 600,000 acre site. Um, and previously the governor awarded the city a little over $20 million to go towards not only the demolition, but also the redevelopment of this site. This is located on the west side of Syracuse and has been an eyesore for years. Um, I would even say decades. So it's really exciting to be able to move forward and make progress with not only knocking down and demoing the site, but also being able to fully redevelop it. Um, what it will look like when it's redeveloped is essentially a new neighborhood because the site is so large. Um, one of the main goals is to add, um, I think around 500 um, new housing units, most being on the affordable side as well as some commercial component to this neighborhood as well. Um, but we are definitely excited for that transformation to occur. Uh, demolition started in April and is expected to be done, I think by the end of fall. Um, and then next year we can start working more closely with um, the developer that we selected, um, which I believe is out of New Jersey um, to, uh, I guess, get more insight into what this new redeveloped area will look like. I mean, that's going to really transform that base of Tip Hill in a way that it's going to be remarkable. So it really, it really is. Okay. Cause as you said, it's been decades. I know that when I moved here, it was starting to decline. That was 35 years ago. And it has been definitely uh, going in decline for this entire time period over the last 35 years. So when you think about, now this is going to be a, a, a tough question, I think, but I mm -hmm. think we need to ask, ask it. When I attend many of the meetings concerning um, the renewal and revamping and re rebuilding and expansion of Syracuse, I don't see a lot of faces in the room that look like me. And I don't understand why. Now, George knows I, I've had this conversation with him a thousand times. Mm. I come back each time frustrated. But since I have an expert here who's really looking behind the scenes as to what's going on, why aren't we showing up for many of the informational meetings or to, to receive reasons? What, what do you see happening? So yeah, I think there are a combination of things happening here because I, I'll even admittedly say our office has been puzzled about um, how to solve some of this issue as well. Um, so one of the things I feel like is A, there is definitely 
um, I'll say a lack of attention to information that's being disseminated. And I won't even necessarily say a lack of attention. I'll say maybe it's just missed opportunity there. Um, so I think it's really important and essential that people get connected with different local agencies and organizations that um, specialize in and or knowledgeable of the different opportunities and events that are occurring that people can get involved in, um, I'll say these different things that are happening in the city. Um, additionally, I feel like another big one is, you know, similar to how you said you don't see many faces of people that look like us. I think that that can be sometimes discouraging for people um, and in a sense give almost imposter syndrome um, you know, causing people to doubt their own skills and accomplishments mm -hmm. um, in those specific fields and areas where they are well, I'll say, positioned and or equipped to be able to take on those opportunities. Um, and then on the flip side, you have other people who may have those ideas and those wants to be involved in these type of opportunities but they don't have the, um, I'll say support um, and the know-how to get those necessary connections. Um, so I feel like there's a combination of things happening that is causing people to kind of not take advantage of this. And that's been our, our job to help <clears throat> make things easier in that sense. So reaching out to your office, I'm sure, okay, what, so what I'm hearing is that reaching out to your office 100% is going to make it easier. Absolutely. Okay. Because that's why you're there to make sure that this process is easier, uh, more accessible. And I, I don't want to say necessarily friendlier because I don't, I've never felt that, th that there's a, a lack of friendliness, okay, in, in some of the meetings have been there, but more accessible. Uh, and more palatable as far as the process is, is concerned. So we're going to pivot here, unless there's something else you want to tell me about the development, minority developers that, that we have missed. Is there anything else that I should emphasize at this point? Um, I would say there's nothing else really to emphasize. I just want to mention that, you know, um, actively we are on the ground, bootstraps running, um, we also are here to support if anyone does have questions or needs guidance and are even able to make those necessary connections. So I just want to say if people do feel stuck or if they do feel like, um, you know, there, is, there isn't a place for them in this field, um, please speak up um, and please um, you know, work very closely with your local organizations and agencies, as well as us here at the city. Tap into that. Okay. okay so now we're going to make a big pivot. It's almost like turning a wheel. And, and that has to do with um, the certification processes that are necessary to really get involved with many of the contracting opportunities that are here uh, before us. I'm just going to throw this out there are so many alphabets, my head hurts okay, at times trying to figure out what they are. So why don't we start with the alphabet soup and at least get everybody on the same page as far as what, what there is and what the certifications look like. So um, there, as you mentioned, it can be a little confusing just thinking about not only all of the different certifications, but even what those acronyms stand for. So the first one I'll call out is what's called the Minority Women Business Enterprise Certification, also known as MWBE. Um, this works specifically with at the not only city level, but the state act has their own separate process of certifying MWBEs. And what it allows you to do is it opens up opportunities for um, minority and women owned businesses to be able to access more government contracts um, to essentially help grow their businesses. Um, outside of MWBE, you have what's called SDVOB, Service Disabled 
veteran-owned businesses, um, similar to MWBEs, SDVOBs also will have the opportunity to um, procure more contracts um, for government contracts rather. And then the last certification I want to mention is the DBE, Disadvantaged Business Enterprise. Um, specifically, this opens up the opportunity for people um, to be able to secure um, federal dollars, specifically that relate to like infrastructure and transportation related projects. Um, but like 81. Yes, okay. absolutely. <laughs> that was gonna, I was just going to say that's you the gonna say that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the reason I want to emphasize that is because um, at the federal level, they don't recognize MWB certifications. So if you wanted to secure a uh, contract such as under the I-81 contracts, um, you would need to be DBE certified um, in order to take advantage of those opportunities. Can, can I just add a caveat to what you're saying? May yes. I? Okay. Absolutely. So anybody can bid on anything, but when contractors are looking to meet the goals set by these entities, then they have to, your business to count towards their goal would have to have those certifications. That's, I'm on the, because anybody can bid for anything, but I just wanted to add that. Do you know why I know that? Because I used to do the MBE certification back in the day for the city. Did you know that? I did, I did not, not know, know that. that, George. <laughs> See there, you learn something every time. How about okay. that, yeah. Okay, all right then. So, so getting to that point of um, bidding and the bid process, um, we had an interesting conversation, Brianka, on the fact of um, general contractors versus subcontractors, and what uh, really is when we look at the landscape more likely to happen with m many of our develop uh, our, our contractors as far as their access to to uh, dollars and projects. So why don't you go through that a little bit and how that stacks up together, okay? Uh, so typically when you see, or when the different agencies, whether it be the state, the county, or even the city, um, release different procurement opportunities, um, typically they'll also be like larger projects. So with that, you'll find that um, smaller contractors, which are also considered the subcontractors, don't necessarily have the capacity to take those projects on alone. That's where like prime contractors, I would like to use like Cuba Brewer, for example, mm -hmm. um, because they're such a large contractor, um, take on these projects. And then due to the fact that um, they'll have like um, utilization requirements, depending mm -hmm. on the certification, that's when they'll work with a subcontractor to help fulfill and meet whatever that utilization goal is. So for example, for the city, we match what the state's utilization goal is of 30%. I believe it's 18% um, MBE, Minority Business Enterprise, and then 12% WBE, Women Business Enterprise. Um, and what will happen is if there is a $100,000 contract that is awarded to a prime contractor, $30,000 of that contract needs to be utilized on an MWBE firm. So that's almost guaranteeing $30,000 will be spent on an MWBE. And that's also what we mean when we say as George eloquently mentioned, it opens up and creates more access um, if you're certified. So I, I love the fact that, that you went through those numbers because it's important for us to really look at the numbers based on the magnitude of what's happening around the county and the overall area as far as the city is concerned. Do you have an idea, a rough idea of how much money is currently on platform to be utilized in the in the contracting area over say over the next year to two. Um, I don't have an idea only because I haven't refreshed um, 
are going to refresh or update on some of the procurement contracts that the city has been um, releasing. Um, but I definitely know it's well over a billion dollars for sure. Okay. Um, maybe even closer to like $5 million. And that's just at the city level. Um, and again, you know, all the different state agencies have different numbers um, and different amounts that have different requirements. Okay. So when I see the number out there from Micron, it says we our project over the next 20 years is going to equate to somewhere between 100, 100 to $120 billion. That 30% number is also part of that $120 billion, is it not? Um, to an extent. So like Micron, they did get, I think most of their funding that they'll be putting into the project is coming from the company itself. So okay. the company probably has their own standards regarding um, procurement and utilization. But I do know that they've also been committed funding from other um, agencies, such as maybe the state. Um, so with whatever, for example, comes with the state, 30% of that amount would have to be for sure utilized on NWB, SDVOB. Wonderful, Perfect. wonderful. So I think one of the best things that you've said, or at least sort of on the surface touched, is that this is not just here's the award. You have to work toward the award by doing a couple of things that are that are extremely important, like networking and getting to know contractors and, and being known. So to talk to me about that process as far as some of the things that we might be missing in the process. Yeah, I mean, I think some of it you just started to allude to. So for sure, um, ensuring like, you know, it doesn't just stop at the certification process. Um, you know, you need to be out there networking with, um, you know, not only different individuals within your industry, um, but also individuals at different levels of your industry. So that could be other subcontractors, that could be other prime contractors. Um, additionally, um, you should really do your due diligence regarding, um, you know, where the procurement opportunities are coming from. Um, so that you can stay on top of um, any communications related to when those project opportunities are being released. So definitely encourage you to get connected with the, the different procurement departments that exist throughout the different agencies and organizations. Um, and then additionally, you know, just being um, involved in the community um, and just have being alert and attentive regarding any other um, different events or um, happenings that are going on. So I, I have two final questions. The first one is this. I know that this, okay, the process of going through the certifications for a lot of individuals feels like it's it's never going to end. It's the biggest thing that they've ever had to tackle. It's the most paper they've ever had to fill out. Are there people or resources out there to help with this process and to help them get through the process? Absolutely. So, um, for example, here at the city, one of the um, main individuals that I would recommend people get in contact with is the actual assistant director that oversees all of the MWBE certifications as well as SDVOB certifications. Um, this new office, it was formerly the Minority Affairs, is now with DESI, which stands for the Division of Equity, Compliance, and Social Impact. Um, and the assistant director's name is Vaughn Davis. Um, so he's more than happy to assist with uh, anyone who needs help with the certification process, as well as any questions that you have along the way. And if you want to get connected with him, please feel free to also reach out to me directly and I can broach that connection for sure. Um, another um, person I think that could be really helpful here, um, especially when you're looking at maybe DBE certifications, 
um, and not even just the person, but their department as a whole. Um, so the uh, division and of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the county, where they oversee a lot of the different MWBE and the workforce utilization um, related matters. Solid Bay is currently overseeing a program called the DBE One Stop Program. Um, specifically, what this program does is it assists people who are either in the process of getting certified, wanting to get certified, or are certified and are looking for next steps on how to grow their business um, and provides anything from one-on-one -on -one counseling all the way through um, assisting with any financial needs. Um, so I definitely encourage you to get connected with Polit Bay and his team to assist there. Um, and then lastly, um, I will say at the state level, um, just going straight to the certification process, if anyone is interested in that, Robert Highsmith oversees the DBE certification program um, and can assist with anyone who has questions or is looking to get certified there. One more plug actually that I will say is Ricky Brown from Diversify New York. Um, he does provide free services to the community regarding the um, MWBE and I believe even DBE certification process. Um, so please tap in to him if you need any help there as well. All right, so here's, here's my final question because you've said it, I don't know, three or four times that you are available, you are available, you are available, but I haven't heard your phone number. Oh, yes, absolutely. So again, Brianka Hill, also go by Brie Hill. Uh, my phone number is 315-448-8538. Also, my email is bhill, B-H-I-L-L, at S-Y-R dot G-O-V. Um, myself, you can contact at any point through either one of those channels or even just reach out to my office here, the Division of uh, Business Development within the city. Um, and we'd be happy to work with anyone who has any questions, even if you missed uh, the main point of contact of who you should go to for anything today, just come straight to us and we'll share that you're redirected to the right person. Well, thank you very much, Brianka. Again, this is Ms. Brianka Hill, Director of Business Development for the C City of Syracuse, who's been talking to us about the development of all of the multi-family, multi-housing uh, uh, spaces across the country, excuse me, across the, the city, concerning primarily what business development and developers should do as far as black and brown developers and understanding the MWBE, DBE certification process. Reach out to her. I want to go to the next meeting and see it flooded with faces that I that look like me. It's time for us to stop waiting. Don't be afraid. You have the skill sets and you have the resources to back you if you have questions or need additional assistance. I'm Vicki Brackens with Brackens Financial Solutions Network. Give us a call, 315-930-4499. Please subscribe, share, and comment to this segment. And I will now say, George Kilpatrick, our plate is full. All right, Vicki Brackens is the president of Brackens Financial Solutions Network, LLC, and a registered representative of LPL Financial, member SIPC. She is America's money maven.